Welcome back CSI 2021ers. This will be the final in our three-part segment discussing hardware architecture in the CPU itself. Just to keep us on track in terms of logistics, a reminder one more time that this material comes primarily from Chapter 4 of Bryant and O'Halloran, and it being a rather dense endeavor, uh, it's all right to skim through this one to pick up some of the high points. Very soon you should start looking in some more detail at Chapter 6, which is on the memory system. Slightly out of order, as we're going to bypass Chapter 5 on code optimizations, as it's an important optimization up front to understand and exploit the memory architecture as much as possible. Most other code optimizations uh, are contingent on having good memory access patterns. So we'll start instead with Chapter 6 and then come back uh, later on uh, to Chapter 5 to, to talk about uh, code optimizations. Uh, in pursuit of that study of performance, uh, be having a look at Chapter or uh, Homework 9, which is on timing the performance of various uh, small segments of arithmetic code, you'll start to notice some interesting things there uh, that will be explainable in terms of the hardware architecture that we're gonna round out today. In particular, observing uh, the presence of the processor pipeline and uh, po uh, possibly superscalar features of the hardware architecture is that's what's going to explain to some extent uh, some of the weird observations that you make in homework nine and pay dividends when we round around to uh, assignment four. So we left off last time after having introduced two important elements into the computing system. Uh, the first was a clock circuit, and are largely we're going to assume that that's present in almost all cases up to this point, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, the frequency of the clock as we move forwards with respect to operational efficiency. And the second was this interesting set of feedback circuits uh, known at the low level as SR latches, although you can combine a few of those into a flip-flop. Their primary intent is to create a storage unit, uh, usually referred to as SRAM or static RAM. And this allows you want to store individual individual bits in uh, a circuit and, and through combining those bits uh, and multiplying them out, uh, you can create registers, uh, for instance. And this is a detailed diagram uh, that combines uh, these little boxes, which are individual flip-flops, uh, into a 16 by 16 register file. That's, uh, that is, uh, these uh, collections of registers are grouped into uh, 16, uh, which gives you a 16-bit quantity that you can store here. And there are 16 of them, uh, meaning that like the x86-64 system, there's an uh, A register, a B register, a C register, uh, up to uh, uh, 16 total registers. Uh, in the x86-64 system, uh, rather than groups of 16 here, you'd have groups of 64 uh, to represent the 64 bits that can be stored in those registers. And we also saw in that discussion that multiplexers, this selection style circuit, appear here again to allow you to select one or two of the registers to come out of the register file and talk to other parts of the processor. I'll expand on that uh, very shortly uh, as our next step in this trajectory is to talk about how all these pieces uh, are fit together to form that full-on processor. Uh, here it is in the very next slide, uh, the full shebang. Uh, and it is a combination then uh, of the register file that we've discussed involves a bunch of those flip-flops to store bits uh, and allows for up to two of them to come out and one of them to be written back into the register file. Those are usually connected in some way to an earlier part of the, uh, the processor that involves the program counter or instruction pointer, as we call it, uh, that RIP, uh, along with some memory that's similar to the register file, stores the individual bits of binary instructions uh, that are to be used. Encoded in those instructions are usually some bits that dictate which registers are going to participate or be used in an instruction. If I'm adding the RA and RB registers together, then part of those instructions will be some binary numbering that dictates uh, the register file should be queried and pass those bits so that out of the register file comes the values that are presently stored in the A and the B registers. They come along these uh, black lines here, uh, which are generally uh, a kind of bus or essentially uh, an abstraction of sets of wires that carry individual bits uh, that are to be communicated to the register file to extract certain register values out of it. Uh, and then those register values that come out of these bits over here. Generally, the wider uh, the line here, the implication is that there are more bits of information that are to be transferred uh, via electrical signals along them. 
So part of the uh, instruction uh, sort of fetch cycle is to examine the register that contains the program counter or instruction pointer and use that to figure out which of the instructions in memory uh, to pull out. Uh, that instruction in its binary encoding then dictates uh, which of the register elements to pull out in terms of values. And another part of the binary encoding for the instruction would dictate, for instance, which of the arithmetic logic units instructions uh, to allow to pass through. And we saw earlier that through a multiplexer on the output side of this arithmetic logic unit, one can select, uh, do I want the or of two numbers to come out, or the and of two numbers, or the sum of those two numbers. Uh, and that, along with the two values that are coming in from the register file, are fed into the ALU. And what comes out is the results of what is being done to those two registers. Uh, the value that's communicated out then moves along and one possible uh, sort of destination for it could be in main memory. This is a rather complex uh, bit of business that we'll need to talk about in its own right later when we discuss the memory system. But generally, uh, either one of the registers or some other part of the instruction here can contain a main memory address, which will cause the value that's computed here uh, to be written out to main memory. Alternatively, you can see a cycle here where one of the values that is computed can be written back to the register file. Could be that the instruction that's being executed is just a fetch uh, to extract something from main memory, in which case uh, there isn't a lot the ALU is gonna do, perhaps participating in helping to compute what address uh, to, to kick out. Uh, but mainly this will be an access to main memory that retrieves a value, uh, which is then written back to the register file. Uh, alternatively, maybe the register file is being accessed uh, directly to, to extract two values, like the A register and the B register. Those are being added together, and the result is still to be stored back in the register file. Uh, for instance, overwriting the destination a B register, as in add A onto B and write the value back into whatever the B register is here. So that's the explanation for why there is a cycle here. Uh, finally then, uh, this new program counter connection comes back around to change uh, the program counter itself uh, to indicate that perhaps a jump occurred, which is gonna change this uh, program counter to be something that's not immediately after uh, what was uh, being done. Uh, uh, alternatively, even normal instructions uh, will take the program counter and increment it by some quantity that corresponds to however big the instruction is. Now, uh, you can tell from this block diagram that there are a lot of details that we are missing out here. But as a first pass at understanding how all of these pieces fit together to become an actual computer, uh, this is not too bad. You'll see all sorts of things here that relate to the assembly language that we have studied thus far, x86-64, uh, and the features of it we observed while using it, along with some aspects of the lower level architecture in terms of gate level descriptions that we've discussed up to this point. Uh, so for instance, this explains why a lot of the x86-64 assembly instructions involve two registers, uh, that there's an A and a B operand that's being pulled out of the uh, register file. Uh, it also explains then why there's a correspondence at the binary level uh, to uh, some instruction sort of numberings uh, that will dictate which part of the ALU is exercised. Uh, and also some part at the binary level in the instruction that dictates which registers are to be used. Uh, you can also see a connection here of the ALU to these condition codes uh, or flags register uh, that shows uh, what the status of the last operation was. Uh, usually this is a special spot uh, in, that is st storing some result that comes out of the ALU that's always computed. Um, so to that end, another good high-level observation to make is that you can divide to some extent this uh, discussion of a full-on processor into some stages, uh, which uh, that division will come in handy later on, that there's generally a stage in the processor uh, in which you need to fetch what instruction is to be executed. This involves participation of the program counter or instruction pointer, the special register that indicates the memory address of the next instruction to execute that's used to access some block of memory that stores instructions. Uh, from there then is extracted some binary level bits uh, that are used uh, and decoded uh, to uh, determine which of the registers are needed and then passed on uh, to actually execute some instruction oftentimes involving the arithmetic logic unit. Uh, there's usually a stage then where you need to wait for main memory to update, either by retrieving something from it or writing something to it. 
uh, and also have to wait for the register file to be overwritten with any results that were computed here. Uh, and then finally, the new program counter is uh, passed forwards to store in the uh, program counter register. Uh, that increment might happen here or due to the conditional jump nature of what's happening up here, it might take a little while to compute that thing. Eventually it's written back so that the whole cycle can start over. Uh, to that end then, uh, this is a fairly complete picture of what the modern CPU does, although we have some more details to discuss. The first and most important uh, sort of thing to discuss in terms of behavior that you'll observe in modern CPUs uh, is that the current regime that we have is too slow to be effective. Uh, if we look back just a little ways uh, to this uh, general picture of the CPU, you'll see a lot of wires connecting to a lot of other wires, but essentially the nature of this thing is cyclic, that uh, once I get all the sequence of things done, uh, then I can begin this next thing. Importantly, we observed earlier on that each of the block diagrams that you see here and a lot of the uh, in computes sort of activities that happened, uh, like the ALU, uh, they're strings of gates uh, that happen in sequence. Uh, and if we just back up a little ways towards the beginning of our discussion, uh, we talked about uh, these circuits, uh, for instance, a full adder that you would string to another full adder, which you would string to another full adder in order to do something like multi-byte uh, arithmetic or multi-bit arithmetic, rather. Uh, and we also observed early on that one of the features of circuitry like this uh, that is of importance is what is the longest path from an input uh, to the eventual output, and how many gates do I pass through on that? Uh, it's maybe not obvious at first, but there is a very long path baked into a circuit like this. Uh, it starts from the inputs over here and them all combining in various ways and having to go through this lower part that calculates a carry bit uh, and becomes a C out, which becomes a C in uh, down here uh, to the next stage in this uh, multi-bit uh, full adder business. So the longest path is actually from these inputs through the entirety of all of these gates uh, to finally be the C out or carry bit that comes out of it. Uh, to that end, in order for me to trust what the entirety of the results are for this adder, I have to wait some time unit that corresponds to how many gates uh, these uh, pass through. Uh, and if I'm waiting for not just these out ones, out twos, and out uh, threes and so forth uh, to come out, but have to wait for the entirety of the circuit uh, to the signal to propagate so that the C out down here stabilizes, this is a considerably longer period uh, that I have to wait uh, versus uh, the sort of early things that come out before that. That the entirety of this thing isn't going to stabilize until I can finally say, yeah, I've waited long enough for this thing um, to, 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 to stabilize. Typically then, as you would work with a clock circuit, the time that you would tick is uh, sort of dependent on whatever the longest path in a circuit like this is. And you want to set up your clock so that it doesn't tick so fast that it, be, it sort of goes down, up, and then down again uh, before rising again. You'd want uh, uh, to make sure that the output down here stabilizes, not just the earlier outputs. Uh, so to that end, uh, the speed at which we could tick the clock for this somewhat complicated thing is contingent on waiting for the entirety of the signal to propagate through all of these stages, including the main memory fetches and the write back and then so forth. Uh, this practically is very, very slow. And so the first thing that we need to resolve is how one might make this go faster. There are a couple ways on that you could envision doing this, but there are two general categories for this. And I'd encourage you to think about how you make things in the real world go faster when it's a fairly complex process, uh, something that looks like this, where you have a bunch of things coming in terms of instructions to do, uh, and you don't necessarily want to wait for one to entirely clear before beginning the next one. Uh, a good way to envision this is in lots of sort of real world settings like manufacturing uh, or if you've been a teaching assistant, how you go about grading a, a bunch of exams. Uh, if you ever had a group project that sort of emulates that, you know that. But I think one of the simplest examples is something like a lunch line or a car wash. 
Take a moment and just ponder this for a second. For a complex process like the CPU architecture we've outlined, how could you adapt some of these real-world approaches to improving throughputs of producing results there uh, uh, so that you get the results faster uh, than what you would uh, sort of envision of, let me let one instruction go all the way through this thing before I begin doing the next instruction. Pause the video for a second, uh, take a moment to consider that, and then we'll come back and discuss some potential answers together. Three, two, one, and here are your answers in the next slide. Generally, these follow one of two general paradigms. You either create multiple stages in this complex process that you are uh, sort of committing to and allow for uh, folks, uh, or so the things that you're trying to do, uh, to one to start before the first one has even finished. And we'll come to know this uh, as a pipelined processor. And in this small example here, uh, you can see that uh, the gentleman in front who's getting uh, his uh, Salisbury steak here, uh, he's not yet completed, yet we've already started someone else uh, through this service line to get things that are available earlier on. Uh, naturally, uh, the observation that we made of the stages that are present in this CPU are going to lend themselves somewhat to this kind of a service, although it will require some more complexity to be introduced into the processor. Uh, that if we can start fetching another instruction before we're even finished decoding the next instruction, we can have several instructions in flight, and based on this uh, sort of architecture, it's between uh, there's three to six possible instructions here uh, to correspond to the different uh, stages in the pipeline here. Importantly though, uh, you'll want to understand that uh, as the program counter is being updated here, I have to allow uh, the instruction to be fetched uh, based on the current value of the program counter before I finish it. Uh, and as I would be decoding an instruction, I have to make sure that the decoding happens before I produce results from the fetch here of what to decode next. And so there's going to be the introduction of some new elements into the process there. But generally, breaking each of these stages so they can execute somewhat in isolation, this will be referred to as a pipeline processor. It has its ups and downs, but we'll talk about those in just a second. An alternative to this, uh, which is somewhat complementary actually, is to duplicate the number of resources that you have available. You can see that somewhat in the background over here that is actually a second duplicate line uh, in the lunch line here uh, that probably has the same set of entrees that are prepared and is allowing a separate line of customers to go through. Another common spot that you would see this uh, is in ATMs where instead of having just a single ATM to provide its services, uh, you have several ATMs stacked next to each other. Uh, and generally then uh, folks line up either for an individual uh, ATM or you have several, uh, a single line where uh, whoever's in front gets to pick an ATM that's available. Uh, and thus, if one person is hogging an ATM by doing a long set of transactions, you have a second ATM that's available for others to make use of to scooch through uh, hopefully faster. We'll come to know this idea of having multiple duplicate resources in the CPU as a superscalar processor. And it doesn't necessarily even need to be pipelined in order to exploit this. The most common resource that's duplicated in CPUs is to have more than one arithmetic logic unit. Uh, so that back in this picture, if I said I don't need just one ALU, I'm going to have several ALUs, two or three of them for instance. Uh, and if you have some uh, a more complex decoding uh, uh, that's present in the early stages of the processor, uh, you can observe I see two uh, add instructions that are coming along. I can deploy those at the same time, not just to my one ALU, but to, to the two duplicate ALUs that are present there. So let's consider uh, these uh, in turn. Uh, we'll start with that pipelining business. Anybody who's been to a car wash ever and gone through it uh, will probably notice that in a, in a reasonably sized car wash, uh, it's not the case that you wait for one car to go through the entire car wash before the next car enters uh, that bit of business. Uh, instead, there are usually stages to this car wash that include things like uh, a spot to pay, that's stage A, uh, and then an uh, early part of the car wash where you'll see water and soap come down, and then maybe a final stage in the car wash that is the blowers that dry off the car. 
Uh, so in a very slow sort of implementation of this, you could have one car uh, pay and then go in, get washed and uh, rinsed off, and then have the blower sort of work on it. And only after that car exits uh, the entirety of the car wash does the next car in line, the blue car in this case, uh, begin by starting its payments and then going in and getting washed and then dried off. And only after that operation is done uh, does the third car get to go in. Uh, this is generally slow, so what you'll see in the real world is that after car A, or sorry, op, uh, car A, this red car, uh, it pays and does this sort of uh, A operation, it will move in, allowing uh, the next car to actually drive up to the pay station and start making payments. Meanwhile, uh, when uh, the, those two cars have finished their stages, as in uh, the red car, uh, car one has finished its sort of rinse cycle, it'll move on to the blowers, uh, allowing the blue car, uh, car two, to move in and get its sort of wash and rinse part, allowing car three, uh, the green car, uh, to begin its payment cycle. Uh, this improves throughput a lot because uh, you are parallelizing uh, the different sort of resources that are available in terms of stages of the car wash, allowing those cars uh, to stack closer. And in terms of the time to deliver all three cars, uh, then uh, the, in the first case, you have to wait sort of a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine units of time for all cars to clear. Uh, but in this case, since I'm stacking, I wait one, two, three, four, five units of time uh, to completely finish all cars. This is the general approach in a pipelined processor uh, in which I can start executing uh, an instruction by fetching and decoding it uh, and then begin executing it while the next instruction I'll move on to fetch and decode it. It's important uh, to observe then that this allows me to spin the clock at a much higher frequency because rather than the clock cycle waiting for the entirety of the instruction to complete, I spin the clock uh, or run it at a frequency that relates to however long the longest stage in the pipeline completes. And this explains to some extent the high uh, frequency in the gigahertz range of processors that you'd see in the modern era. Uh, this allows the throughput uh, to be better in the processor because uh, each instruction, operation one, operation two, operation three, can be done before the previous instruction even completes. Uh, but you'll see then that despite each of these instructions taking a total of three cycles to complete, uh, sort of a latency of three uh, cycles, uh, each uh, uh, the throughput of the processor is essentially after it gets uh, filled up in terms of the pipeline is one cycle per instruction. Um, so uh, after waiting for three cycles, I'll see operation finished. Waiting one more cycle sees operation two finished. And one more cycle later, uh, I see operation three finishing. Um, there are some parts of the process pipeline, such as multiplication, that are sometimes uh, staged in this way as well. Uh, that you can compute part of the multiplication results uh, and then begin computing another multiplication properly uh, on the internal side. That means that while the multiplication instruction itself has this latency of three instructions, uh, its throughput is essentially one cycle per instruction. Uh, so after getting full up, uh, you'll observe that the multiplications come out at a rate of one per cycle. And this will start to explain some of what you observe in homework nine. Uh, that for instance, if you do multiplications correctly, uh, you'll observe they take longer than instru uh, add instructions. Uh, however, uh, stacking them on top of each other, as long as you're clever about where uh, you're writing the results to uh, and clever uh, that they don't interfere with each other, those subsequent multiplications, uh, they can yield instructions as fast as one per cycle. So uh, to that end, uh, the alternative part of this, uh, or sorry, uh, to expand on the, the, this pipeline bit of business, uh, is that uh, we need to sort of lay out some additional hardware to enable uh, the pipeline processor. Your textbook does so in some gory detail in this Y8664 assembly language uh, that the textbook authors actually go to the trouble of establishing a hardware description language uh, and laying out in that hardware description language a sequential processor implementation uh, and a pipeline version of this. Uh, in fact, in some offerings of 2021, you actually go in to augment some existing hardware description language that looks sort of like those VHDL languages we were looking looking at earlier uh, to enable additional pipelining to occur in this. 
It's a bit beyond the scope of what we are interested in doing at the moment, but it is worthwhile to look at least at the sort of theoretical and final design of this pipe architecture the layout. Uh, just a minute, a moment uh, to comment on this Y8664 business. This is an imaginary uh, assembly language, but it relates very closely to the X8664 assembly language that we have studied, uh, which is a real language. It's essentially the textbook author's uh, simplification of that X8664. So they eliminate a bunch of things like uh, the wacky uh, operands uh, in X8664 that allow you to do uh, these parenthesized uh, three arguments, main memory axis, and so forth. Mainly, this is just to simplify things uh, so that the implementation of that hardware is easier in the hardware description language. Uh, to summarize the results, uh, here is a picture uh, contrast on the left hand side, uh, the Y8664 sequential processor. It's the picture that we looked at before. And on the right hand side is the very closely related pipelined version of this. Now, it should, you shouldn't feel sort of guilty if you're not sure like what exactly is the difference is, uh, is between these two. Uh, so I'll try to point that out uh, to make it apparent. Uh, what you'll see is the same basic pieces are all there in terms of instruction memory and program counter, register files, arithmetic uh, logic unit and control flags and so forth, along with a spot that indicates uh, the memory system is gonna be accessed. All that's present over in the pipeline um, uh, portion as well. Uh, the things that differ uh, are these black-ish blocks that are in between. I guess a dark gray uh, is, is maybe a better description that appear between the different stages in the pipeline. And you'll note that uh, this is a five-stage pipeline and there are one, two, three, four, five of these grayish sort of blocks there. Uh, what these are meant to represent are internal register storage uh, for process uh, pipelined results that are produced that need to be cached for a short time. Uh, the notion of caching here is as follows, that during the execution of this uh, fetch and program counter update uh, stage, uh, it's the case that uh, I'm looking in this instruction memory based on the program counter uh, and incrementing that program counter. Essentially, I need to produce a result here, which is which instruction to execute. Uh, I need to feed that into a little storage area over here, uh, which is not going to change until the clock actually ticks next time. This is because uh, presently this area is storing whatever the last instruction is so it can be read out and used to access uh, the register file. Uh, decode that to retrieve any information that's present there. Uh, now in the sequential version of this, I could think of sort of running the clock at a fast rate, uh, but if I'm able to fetch an instruction faster than I can decode it and access the register file, then I may get some weird situation in which uh, my first instruction is being fetched and indicates registers A and B should be used. So while accessing the register file, I managed to pull out a register A, but haven't quite gotten to B yet, but the clock is ticking so fast that I then change the uh, instruction we accessed uh, to the next one uh, to pull out and say, oh, the next instruction actually uses uh, registers D and C. And so I get this weird amalgam of registers read out A from the first instruction and D from the second instruction, which is neither of the instructions that I really want to execute. Uh, to prevent that, from, prevent that from happening and enable the clock to run at a more rapid rate in these pipeline situations, uh, the clock will run such that I populate this register area uh, with the cache results of, right now, work on instructions involving A and B. That's going to be stable uh, and used by the next stage uh, while it reads out uh, the A and B registers, the instruction uh, sort of memory is going to be accessed uh, to determine the next instruction involves registers D and or C and D. And it's going to start writing here, but that won't be complete until the clock ticks again. Uh, we'll run the clock at a rate such that uh, when we commit a new value to access registers C and D here, I already have retrieved A and B registers and written them into this E memory instead. So essentially you view these as changing in block step, that the result from the first stage is written into D and then used in the next clock cycle to access registers, which has already written uh, its result into this E area, which is going to be used to actually execute the instruction.
So these things sort of move forwards ahead in block step. It allows me to click my talk clock, uh, not at the rate that it would take to clear this entire cycle, but just the distance uh, between F and D, or D and E, or E and M, whatever the longest sort of pathway in terms of traversing gates is between these, that's uh, what I have to click, uh, tick my clock at. Uh, but it tends to be much, much shorter in terms of the time and turnaround here uh, than waiting for the entire uh, entirety of the processor to execute. Uh, so this is the sort of important addition to the pipeline processor, uh, which is uh, this set of internal storage units. These tend to be made out of SRAM. Uh, that's the same set of circuitry that we examined earlier uh, that is used to comprise registers. It's one of these flip-flops. So if I decide that communicating in between uh, these stages, uh, and so let me fast forward ahead uh, to those uh, so I can look at both of these together, uh, that these internal stages that uh, in terms of instruction decoding, I decide I need uh, like 128 bits to come out of this instruction memory to store things in here. Uh, then I would have 128 of these uh, flip-flops present in this little gray area here, the D area, that are present to uh, store the decoded uh, or, or the uh, instruction that's being accessed from instruction memory and therefore available to this decode stage as stable stuff uh, to read out of. Uh, that'll be true then throughout uh, each of these sort of gray blocks as there'll be some area of SRAM that caches the results of whatever the output from the earlier stage in the pipeline is uh, and then allows stable write backs of the register file and updates uh, to the program counter. So that summarizes more or less uh, the intent of what's meant by a pipeline processor, one where the clock can tick faster because we've implemented some internal storage uh, and each stage works somewhat independently from the next. There are some drawbacks to this and what you'll observe in terms of homework nine analysis is that there are so-called hazards uh, that are involved in the processor pipeline that prevents the pipeline from uh, achieving the maximal sort of efficiency that it's intended to utilize. One very important pipeline to be aware of at the software level uh, is data inter uh, interdependencies. Uh, a set of instructions that look like this, a multiply followed by an add, uh, allow for pipelining or superscalar effects, as we'll talk about in a minute, uh, because the multiplication instruction and the add instruction, they are changing two different spots in the processor uh, and so are independent of one another. Uh, in terms of the pipeline itself, I can execute this multiply instruction. It may take a little while, but uh, I can chug along and say, oh, this add is actually going to modify a different register. And so it can be done and won't interfere with the multiply at all uh, in order of uh, completion. I'm modifying the EAX and the EDX registers. They're separate. On the other hand, uh, the two instructions, multiply and add, if they're both changing the same register, as in I'm gonna multiply to triple EAX and then add one on to the same register, the only way to do that without getting incorrect results is to wait for this multiply to completely finish before adding on. And essentially what you'd observe in a pipeline processor then is as the multiply instruction comes through, uh, it begins to access the AAX register and I do some multiplies and so forth. And as the uh, add instruction comes through, it's detected that, ooh, this one is actually gonna change EAX, but I don't actually have the answer that I need in AAX to add on to the right number at this point. If I add on to it and then write back to it with a plus one, I'll miss or overwrite uh, the results that were uh, going to come from the multiply. So that end, you just have to wait, as in the add is going to cause a stall here and wait for the multiply instruction to completely clear through this pipeline before the add can move through and begin filling the pipeline up again. Uh, so those kinds of hazards uh, that show up in terms of data dependencies are the kinds of things that hand-coded assembly should try to avoid and the compiler almost always tries to avoid. That it'll almost always, whenever possible, generate instructions that look more like this imol and then an add l, uh, where the uh, write back is done to independent locations. Uh, and you'll observe then time differences for the C level code that reflects these uh, assembly level instructions uh, as you're timing stuff in homework nine. The other spot that you'll oftentimes see hazards are in branch prediction. 
uh, in that the processor, as it would see branches that are conditional, as in add some stuff onto EAX and ECX, and then do a comparison to see if ECX is bigger or smaller than some uh, sigil value like ESI here, uh, then either jump back up to loop again or move forwards to get beyond this loop. Since the processor doesn't know which instruction to begin executing next at this branch point, either the pop instruction or a loop back to add on more uh, into EAX, it usually has to guess uh, in that it will, if the last 99 times uh, I have looped back and done the add onto EAX, it'll probably guess that that's what's going to happen in this case. All pro modern processors have this notion of branch prediction then, where it's looking at what's been done in the past and guessing that's what it's going to be next. This allows one then uh, to keep the pipeline reasonably filled at the expense of having some hardware circuitry that has to be able to unwind and say, oh, I guessed wrong and I started doing some additions here, which have changed the register values. But the actual branch, once that instruction cleared, said I should really be going down to this RBX instead. Uh, the modern processor has to have, if it does branch predictions like that, uh, some ability to unwind and back up and say, actually, I was branching down here, so I'm going to change these registers, which I altered earlier, back to whatever they would have been if I started here instead. That clears out the pipeline and sends control down here instead, which is oftentimes uh, sort of costly in terms of a bunch of clock cycles have to be devoted to that undoing of that operation uh, and then starting down the correct path then. Most of this is uh, stuff that you're insulated from. Uh, and at the software level, all you're able to control is this stream of assembly instructions. Uh, it's at the underlying processor level uh, that this prediction business happens, the out of order execution potentially happens of doing these two things simultaneously uh, up here rather than these two things uh, which will have to happen in sequence. The hardware is really detecting when those, those things are necessary. Uh, and to a great extent, you don't have a control over it, except to try and lay down instructions that favor efficient execution by the processor itself. Uh, the last bit uh, uh, that's worth mentioning is that it's usually fairly costly to detect these things in terms of power and execution. Uh, so detecting upfront that I can do these two things in parable, uh, parallel uh, using uh, either pipelined or superscalar, uh, two different ALUs for these two different um, uh, instructions, and predicting ahead of time that uh, I'm going to take this earlier branch versus this uh, second branch down here and ha implementing this at the hardware level to be able to unwind that. These things tend to be costly in terms of power. And so most low power uh, processors have at least a mode where you turn off a lot of these complex decoding features. Uh, and that puts you in this mode where you do more of a sequential kind of execution where you're not uh, executing as deep of a pipeline, not trying to guess which branch to take and not deploying instructions to multiple ALUs as much. Uh, for instance, the ARM processor in most modern phones usually comes in a couple modes when you would see a uh, low power mode pop up off on your mobile phone, uh, this is usually going to put the processor in a mode where it's not guessing on branches or deploying uh, to multiple ALUs anymore. This tends to save power at the expense of performance, as in you get better performance if you can do things in parallel uh, and predict which branches because it keeps the pipeline filled up more so, uh, but it does spend more battery in those low power settings. Uh, the Superscalar side of this then uh, also explains to some extent uh, how one is able to see these multiplication and addition instructions overlapping. As you would analyze things in uh, homework nine, you'd see that there are typically multiple functional units that could, uh, for instance, two or three ALUs that could simultaneously add or multiply uh, different numbers so long as the registers that are targeted there are not overlapping. It's very likely that you observe uh, as long as you're adding uh, two or three uh, different uh, uh, sort of uh, two, two or three different uh, locations in memory, usually two or three different uh, registers, uh, you'd be able to employ those functional Unix in parallel. So what would take, uh, you'd measure, for instance, it takes me one second to do this many additions, but so long as I'm adding to a second and distinct location, doing two additions in the same loop will not cost you anything extra. 
can get up to even three or four additions uh, that can happen in parallel like this, uh, which allow for one second uh, to occupy you and accomplish more additions in that time. Um, so to that end, uh, you'll then want to aware, uh, be aware that an important thing you can do at the software level is to add and uh, multiply into different variables, uh, which will be translated at the assembly level to different registers. This can open up both the pipeline and the superscalar features of a processor uh, to perform more uh, efficiently. It's oftentimes very difficult from the outside to determine whether a processor is benefiting from this kind of instruction stream because it is a superscalar, has more than one ALU, or if it's benefiting from it because it's able to more efficiently pipeline instructions that are writing to different destinations here. It is not tremendously important for me uh, uh, that you understand when exactly these things are happening. It is important that you understand what the difference between uh, the notion of a superscalar processor and the notion of a pipeline processor is. Uh, superscalar boils down to I have more than one arithmetic logic unit, so if I have fancy decoding uh, bits, I can determine that I can do uh, simultaneously two additions. A, a pipeline processor is one that divides uh, its operations into stages like this. So here we have uh, five different stages, but only a single ALU. Uh, if you combine these two features together, as in plop down another ALU and introduce some additional complexities in the decoding stage of the software, along with maybe some additional bandwidth for the register to pull out not two, but four or six different things at a time, uh, then you can get the best of both worlds, both the pipelining features and exploit multiple ALUs. Modern processors are an amalgam of both these things, uh, that they have both superscalar features and are usually very deeply pipelined. Uh, we're talking seven to 15 stages in the modern processor. Uh, so to that end, uh, from the outside looking in, it's hard to tell which is happening, and in most cases, the modern processor uh, both is there. These are both forms of parallelism, uh, although they take a different character. The superscalar part of this is uh, actually truly parallel, as in I'm using two or three ALUs at once here, versus the pipelining here is I'm doing multiple things in parallel, but it's usually different things. Uh, if we back up, uh, I'm doing multiple instructions in parallel, it's just that each of those instructions are a different stage uh, of the pipeline. Uh, so it's exploiting the different hardware that exists as a matter of this being a sequential process, uh, just doing so in a pipeline fashion. So modern processors are extremely strange uh, and exhibit these pipelines and uh, superscalar uh, features that make for very unintuitive uh, results in timing experience. Uh, your uh, homework dine, uh, typo, it should be homework dine these days, although lab 10 also sort of introduces some ideas of this uh, for the first part of homework nine. Uh, these timing results then uh, can be somewhat non-intuitive. Uh, and it's important that you have a look there and start to get a little bit of a sense of what you might expect on the modern processor if you are having these type loops that do arithmetic. Uh, sometimes you can get away with extra additions uh, or multiplications more or less for free at that point. It's also the case that this business of branch prediction and out of order um, uh, sort of execution has led to some notable security flaws in modern systems. Uh, if you can trick the processor into doing something uh, that uh, it predicts, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this and carries on with that instruction sequence for a while uh, before the processor realizes, oh, that was the wrong branch to take. You could actually access parts of memory that you're not actually supposed to be able to do so. Uh, the biggest relevance this is, has is not to personal computers, uh, where generally you're the only one using that code, but has more play in cloud computing, where I can submit some job to run on a cloud machine, which is probably actually shared by several other folks, perhaps my competitors, uh, who are also running jobs there. Uh, with the right trickery, it's been demonstrated, at least in theory, that one can uh, get access to some parts of memory that one's not supposed to be able to, to access generally. Uh, and so this is why uh, in the modern CPU, uh, there are some known hardware flaws that tend to be accepted to gain and continue to get the performance out of the processor. On Linux systems, uh, you can sometimes see this. Uh, for instance, if I pull up a terminal right now, 
uh, and use this uh, LS CPU uh, 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 utility, which will show information about my CPU. You can note a list of vulnerabilities mentioned down here. Uh, and many of these probably have to do uh, with uh, some of those um, uh, out of order accesses and uh, prediction uh, businesses. Uh, the general sort of uh, Linux kernel these days accepts these uh, and unless you really have a need for strong security, you probably don't need to worry about Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, if you're terribly concerned about that, you can enable kernel patches uh, that will fix these so if they aren't an issue, but you can expect the cost of that to be much slower performance in terms of your CPU because you'll be eliminating some of the branch prediction speed that you'll get out of the modern processor. Uh, that's about as far into a discussion of those uh, deep and interesting hardware flaws uh, that we'll look for uh, at the moment. Uh, but if you're curious about them, I encourage you to click on the links uh, to follow them, which will take you to some Wikipedia articles uh, about uh, the topic, which deal with them in some more detail than we have at the moment. That'll end our discussion of processor architecture at the moment. Uh, be having a look at homework nine, which is going to discuss and cover uh, some of the timing issues that you'll be expected to see and start to give a flavor to how you can improve code efficiency uh, by demonstrating loops that look like this run slower than loops that look like this other thing. Our next topic is going to be to begin discussion of the memory hierarchy. This plays an important role in processor efficiency as well, because in order for modern processors uh, to efficiently execute instructions, they need to be fed with data. Uh, it tends to be the case that the modern processor can do things a lot faster than it can access memory, and that you can execute multiple instructions, uh, such as additions and multiplications, at a much faster rate than you can actually retrieve things from main memory. Uh, to that end, efficiently accessing the memory system is a big part of making your code run faster, because you can have the fastest process in the world, uh, but if you can't get any data to it at a ready rate, uh, then it's just going to sit there waiting in most cases. Look for that in our next uh, lecture together, and happy hacking until we meet again. <laughs>